935 AD. It is the late Nine Dynasties era. During this time, the Gansu Corridor was under the administration of the Cao Shi of Dunhuang's Wang tribe. The 600-year-old Mo Gao Caves was undergoing another wave of constructions. A simple sculptor by the name of Zhao Sengzi worked in one of these newly excavated caves. After countless months of worth labor, this sculptor breathed a sigh of relief as he gazed upon a completed figure. As he carefully made his way through the site and out of the cave entrance, the man was blinded by the sun. In that instant, it was as if he saw the fabled radiance of the Buddha. Sculptor Zhao has long forgotten which generation of Mo Gao sculptors he belonged to. The Buddha scriptures, having been in each cave since the 4th century, silently recorded the chronicles of those bygone eras. Of course, the level of activity in this Buddhist holy site during the Zhao Sengzi's time was a far cry from its past. Warfare and unrest has turned this crossroads of trade into a ghost town in the middle of the desert. The times of Dunhuang being the destination of visitors from Buddhist pilgrims to artists to learned scholars from all over the world were long gone. Now the only sounds of activity came from the construction of a single grotto. Fortunately, the sculptures of the previous dynasties remained untouched by all this violence and remained preserved in their original conditions. Despite the chaos that preceded each dynastic change resulting in the destruction of many a Buddhist temple, their Buddhist statues and sculptures brutally damaged, Dunhuang's position on the periphery of the empire allowed its sculptures to escape suffering the same fate. For Zhao Sengzi, however, the ability to continue his craft following in the legacy of his forefathers was undoubtedly his greatest joy. Those sculpting techniques were passed down from generation to generation, inherited between craftsmen like an heirloom, seemingly passed to him as if fate itself. It is because the ancient sculptors of history viewed their work with such passion and reverence, and so painstakingly created these figures, that we are able to appreciate them today. Sculptor Zhao probably never would have guessed that over a thousand years later, images of the results of work of he and his fellows would adorn the pages of elementary school textbooks. As for the Mogao Caves, which rose, prospered, and then currently was in decline upon its rediscovery, 
its legacy from a long-reaching history of Buddhism in China awed the world. Within these 492 caves, dating from 10 dynastic periods, there are over 2,000 painted sculptures, more than a thousand of which are made using the floating plastic process. This number of ancient painted sculptures, dating from such an ancient era, and made using such high quality techniques, is rarely seen in the world. Very few painted Buddha sculptures dating from the Tang era have survived to the present day. The only surviving examples are located in sites like Gansu's Bilingzi grottoes, Tangshui Maijishan grottoes, the Buddhist temple on Mount Wutai in Shanxi, and the Nanzhen Ji temple. By observing Danghuang sculptures, we can observe the evolution of painted sculptures from early periods of northern Hui to Sui, through the Tang until the Five Dynasties. More importantly, we can observe the development of sculpting throughout history. That is possible because they were so well preserved. In 1962, a 25-year-old He Er arrived in Dunhuang becoming a researcher at the Dunhuang Cultural Relics Research Institute. As He Er herself describes it, arriving at Dunhuang was one of the most pivotal events in her life. After opening its heavy wooden doors, the dark cave was illuminated by the outside light Standing under the long dormant statues and straining her ears, He uh, could almost hear the distant sounds of tools and idle chatters as the ancient craftsmen worked on their charges. In that same space, in the distant past, this young sculptor's spirits began to surge as he enjoyed a short moment of peace. I believe that Donghuan's art is like a great ocean. I am not an expert on this subject, but I can say for myself that immersing myself in this environment makes me feel like a drop of water in a great ocean. On this basis alone, I am very moved by the achievement of the ancient Chinese. Dunhuang's vibrant, colorful sculptures gave the newly arrived He uh, a powerful shock, so powerful that she still remembers it vividly. At one time, He uh, wanted to find out the name and identity of the creator of these lifelike relics and whom he was apprenticed to, but to no avail. These anonymous craftsmen have no reputation, no historical records at all to show for all of the painstaking work they put into these painted sculptures. Just who could possibly help these humble masters step into the limelight? Luckily, we are able to find such a scenery upon the frescoes of Cave 72 at Mogao. It is through this that we are able to catch a glimpse into scenery of back then. This fresco is from Cave 72, in the middle of the southern region of the cliff. The painting's primary subject is the placement of the head upon the Buddha sculpture of Liangzhou Mount Shengrong. However, 
If we focus upon the fresco's periphery, we can see a scene of the craftsmen of that era creating painted sculptures. This is precious information regarding ancient sculpting techniques and large sculptures in particular. The sculptors depicted in this picture probably didn't realize that over a thousand years later, people would be following a spider's web of clues to discover their stories. The geological structure of the Mogao Caves is part of the Jiuquan Loose Gravel Formation, an amalgamation of silt and gravel. This type of stone is unsuitable for sculpting, so craftsmen resorted to using clay. After building a frame out of wood and reed padding, sculptors then covered the resulting skeleton with clay in order to form their sculptures. After the sculpture hardened, they applied a layer of white stucco and painted upon the resulting shell. This type of sculpture has been referred to by later generations as painted sculptures. Ancient artists researched many techniques. Let's look at it this way. If, if you just take clay and sculpt it, it'll crack. When clay dries, it expands, leading to cracking, which makes painting impossible. So the ancient craftsmen of Donghong created a new technique for making clay. The clay that Zhao Sengzi used for his sculptures was a local mix. The recipe and techniques were passed down from his co-worker's predecessors. In order to ensure that the sculptures will not form cracks and that the paint stays on the final product, sculptor Zhao's predecessors racked their minds to think of a solution. They tried countless mixtures of plant materials and silt and tried each and every one before coming up with the perfect formula and technique, which was then passed down to succeeding generations. The clay mixture contained 30% silt, which doesn't contract, no matter what condition it's under. Additionally, cotton, hemp, and wheat chaff were added to prevent cracking. This formula was applied after three separate trial runs each of which produced sculptures that didn't crack. Overall, the process was rather scientific. Today, these centuries-old sculptures stand intact and on display in front of our eyes. The ingenuity of ancient craftsmen is very impressive. Zhao Sengzi lived during the Five Dynasties era. During that time, Dunhuang's ruler Cao Shi was more fervent than any previous rulers about expanding the Mogao Caves. In order to aid this large-scale project, Cao Shi limited the Chinese system and created a government art academy. During that era, Dunhuang specialized in small-scale sculpture painters, each with their own highly concentrated specialty. Zhao Sengzi was employed in the same manner. He had achieved the proficiency grade of all materials, the highest level possible for sculptor painters. However, this only meant that he was certified as familiar with techniques for painting all kinds of statues it did not change his living arrangements in the least. In feudal societies, craftsmen ranked fairly low on the social hierarchy, but I've always felt that much of the splendor of ancient Chinese was made possible by these lowly craftsmen. He -e is a researcher who arrived in Dunhuang in 1962 to research its painted sculptures she stayed for an entire 12 years, leaving in 1974. 
My primary task was to record and copy the most impressive examples of Don Juan's painted sculptures. These jobs were assigned to us by what was called the Institute's Art Department back then. In addition, Don Juan wasn't so busy back then, so the caves were very quiet. It's a nice feeling when you're there by yourself, copying one of the sculptures. Copying an archaeological artifact in the caves is a several months long ordeal. Aside from eating and sleeping, one's entire time is spent inside that cave. The researchers set about copying these relics with a respectful, almost reverent mindset. The craftsmanship put into the originals was now not only the heritage of those who came before, but a recording of present events. When we went into these caves, we were right next to these sculptures. We could see everything about them clearly, including their backs. Through this proximity, we were able to understand many things about our subjects. We gradually savored the charm of these painted sculptures. You can only really get a feel for the uniqueness of ancient statues by copying them. When you touch these old facsimiles of Buddha, gods, kings, and heroes, you're able to very vividly memorize all of these intimate little details. A millennium later, as the workers are underway copying the sculptures inside these caves, perhaps they began to hear the ancient sounds of excavation. As their imaginations wander, maybe they began to imagine the lives of work of the ancient craftsmen. After his work inside the cave, Chao Sengzi returned home to the adulations of his son. Now, Chao Sengzi believed that it was time to pass on the tricks of his trade to his flesh and blood. The sculptor's son was still young so he didn't understand the importance of the inheritance of his father's craft. He was confused. Who was Buddha? And why did we need to sculpt him? And so, our queries focus on these caves' silent sentinels. Where did these idols come from? And through the changing demographics of the centuries, what changes did they undergo? This is one of Mogao's caves, three oldest caves, it was constructed sometime between 430 and 439 AD. During the Northern Liang of the 16 kingdoms, the traits of seating posture of the sculpture show that it was crafted in the style of the Gandhara people, the Central Asia. This is Musée Goumet in France, currently the world's most renowned museum specializing in ancient art and religious relics. 
Among its displays are some sculptures in the early Gandhara styles. In its heyday, the Gandhara people controlled large amounts of territory, including parts of India, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, centralizing around modern-day Peshawar. It was a very wide area that we now call the Gandhara area. In Buddhism infancy, there were no depictions of the Buddha. One reason was that Buddha was himself opposed to worshipping idols. Another reason was that According to the beliefs of time, Buddha could not be represented in mortal form. Thus, Buddhists used Bodhi trees, thrones, Buddhist relics, footprints, and other forms to represent the Buddha. Scholars are not certain exactly when statues of Buddha first appeared. However, most agree that it was under the Gandhara. We will try to look for traces of resemblance through the records of history here. As it turns out, this foreign culture left a very deep mark upon Dunhuang. Once it arrived at the trade hub, during its extraordinary path along the winding Silk Road. Just as the ancient Greeks associated Buddha with Greeks' aesthetics, the sculptures of Dunhuang let their own artists' biases and local culture influence their image of Buddha. In their corner of China's western frontier. And so, on this stop in Buddhism's journey eastwards, the Bodhisattvas adopted Chinese attire, and the Buddha's facial expression, serene, calm, and refined. From his eyes, lips, face, and poise, one can tell that his image has been completely sinicized through the artist's hands. Dunhuang sculptors digested this foreign culture and meted it into their existing cultural body. This extraordinary innovation helped develop the techniques of painted sculpture making. Of course, once this creativity declines, perhaps it will take the light of Buddha with it. Zhao Sengzi had hoped to pass these sculpting techniques down to his son. However, the life that a sculptor led was not a very prosperous one. When he bequeathed them to his son, perhaps he let out an unconscious sigh as he gazed upon the Tang Dynasty's most amazing examples of his craft. He, however, could in no way surpass that level of technique. Cao Shi's administration, despite being keen on excavating more caves at Mogao, only did so in the Cao clan's name. The sponsor's portraits adorning the walls of the entranceway were ordered to be more eye-catching than even the sculpted interpretations of Buddha and the Bodhisattvas. The quality of these sculptures then fell into decline Soon, they became formulaic, no charm, no spirit. Zhao Sengzi could only rely on his own initiative, his own hard work to bring the beautiful images of the Buddha into his own mind. 
He hoped to create something beautiful, because to him, that had become his life's goal. Even though they were poor, I believe that they must have had their own beliefs, their own dreams. For example, their family safety, an improvement to their own lives, for their own children to flourish in them. I think everyone has at least some of those wishes. I believe that they put their wishes, their own hopes and dreams into their work. I think they put a little of their own lives into these sculptures. If they didn't, how could they have turned out so spectacularly? Like the rest of Dunhuang's peerless craftsmen, sculptor Zhao entrusted his wishes for a better life to his own Buddha sculpture. He poured forth all of his passion and effort. After the completion of his arduous labors, he perhaps returned to this expansive holy land and prayed to the artifacts left by his predecessors. Maybe, he even thought to himself, had he lived in Dunhuang during the Sui dynasty, how would the scenery have changed? The Sui dynasty that rose to power following three centuries of disunity was a miraculous era. Its faith in Buddhism exceeded any other dynasty in Chinese history. Concurrently, it also brought to China wealth unparalleled whence the heights of the Han. It increased trade flow along the Silk Road and expanded its hold over the western frontier. Increasing the commercial exchange between China and its western neighbors as a vital gateway along the Silk Road, Dunhuang experienced a share of that prosperity. The Mogao Caves were greatly revitalized during Sui Dynasty. Within a short span of 30 years, the Sui oversaw the construction and or remodeling of over 94 new grottos, over twice as many as the number overseen by Mogao's founder, Le Zun. The cultured and spiritual Sui Wendi required that cultural works related to Buddhism be lifelike in shape and realistic in appearance, establishing standards for artistic works. Once this decree reached Dunhuang along a long winding silk road, it quickly affected the sculpting of the craftsmen at the Mogao Caves. Thus. The painted sculptures of the Sui began to take on the appearance of flesh and blood and become almost lifelike. Once Buddhism took in people's desires, its art came to life. The Tang Dynasty is said to be the zenith of power over the history of Imperial China. Chinese culture was spread far and wide, and the culture of its neighbors was absorbed by the Tang in return. During those glory days, the techniques of painted sculpting reached their height of sophistication in Dunhuang. Finally, after over 200 years of development, Dunhuang's painted sculpting was allowed to showcase in a very large way. Under the
the tongue, Duan Huang's sculpting techniques were fully matured, the craftsmanship more refined and delicate. Its modeling of the human form were expanded from busts to include the entire human body, and craftsmen reached a deeper understanding and more detailed portrayal of human anatomy. This is a 3D model of a sculpture of Sakyamuni created using computer modeling. This representation of Buddha resides in the shrine within cave 205 of Mogao. Its experiences during over 1,000 years of existence have rendered many of its sculptures damaged or destroyed. However, thanks to technology, we're able to reconstruct their likely appearances based on existing evidence. Through the use of computer-generated imagery, we can get an idea of the Mogao Caves as they were a thousand years ago. How it must have looked as a vast Buddhist pilgrimage destination filled with countless colors artwork under the height of Tung power. This group of sculptures within Cave 45 of the Mogao Caves has been declared one of China's national treasures. The statue of Sakyamuni in the group center is a classic work of Chinese-style Buddhist sculptures. He sits upon an eight-treasured throne, his clothes flowing outwards as he maintains a natural and solemn demeanor. To his side, his oldest disciple, Kasyapa stares intensely ahead with a slight frown upon his brow, a frown upon his lips, and his chest raised high, as if showing that this monk's life is not an easy one. The sculpture fully showcases the techniques of Tang period realism. No matter the angle of observation, it can be said that it is a prime example of Duanhuang realism art. This sculpture from Cave 45 is of Brother Ananda. His tame expression shows his serene and benevolent nature. His posture, clasped hands, and kind face are proof of this young monk's intimate appeal. This set of seven sculptures is arrayed symmetrically according to the aesthetic standards of Buddhism, old next to young, hard next to soft. Each complements its counterpart. It is a masterpiece of Chinese Buddhism art. To facilitate further research, the sculptures of K45 have been recorded in digital 
3D format by the Dunhuang Institute. As a result, the public can view each and every one of them on a computer from any angle, any time they wish. Dunhuang, Mogao Cave Number 158, one of Dunhuang's most beautiful Nirvana caves. Nirvana, originally meaning tranquility, calmness, extinguished, refers to the peaceful spiritual paradise one attains after breaking free from the cycle of reincarnation and suffering. However, just as this depiction of Buddha has lain down to its eternal rest in paradise, after the end of Suitang period of Dunhuang's sculpting bonanza ended for it. Just as Chao Seng Tzu had feared, upon the arrival of the late Tang Five Dynasties period, War raged once more, and China was cut off from its western regions from Dunhuang. The Buddhist art in the Mogao Caves was replaced by secular art. Dunhuang's centuries of bright prominence fell, turned into decline. Sculptor Zhao's portrayal of perfection in his works did not align with his lord, Cao Shi. Cao Shi was more focused on the depiction of these new cave's benefactors, that is to say, his own. This invariably led to the shattering of Zhao Sengzi's dreams. What Zhao Sengzi did not expect was that his life was about to take an even worse path. This is the only document regarding ancient craftsmen found within the cache at the library cave. It is the only document that we have that proves that Zhao Sengzi did in fact exist. This document is currently stored at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris. From this contract, we can learn that earlier that year, Zhao Sengzi lost his home to flooding. Without a home and out of options, he could only give his sons up to a well-off family. So, from this document, from this person, you can see the terrible conditions that these crafters of Donghuan sculptures lived in. After I left Donghuang, I decided to honor these people by creating a masterpiece. The pain of giving up his flesh and blood, the torment of becoming a vagrant. It is through these hardships that Zhao Sengzi's quest for sculpting became a beautiful sustenance. Regardless, he was but one man. He could not change an entire era. And so Dunhuang's sculpting fell to the wayside. The formerly resplendent Buddhist have finally fell silent. A thousand years later, however, 
people once again reverently opened the way to Dwin Huang's stone caves. Long buried under mountains of sand, they were not only looking for the splendors of an ancient Buddhist community, but their narrative now included those humble craftsmen, like Zhao Sengzi, who made such marvels possible. Let's take a closer look at this large Buddha in Cave 130. This statue once gazed upon Zhao Sengzi, upon He Er, uh, upon countless thousands of reverent worshippers. For those men and women, this great work and the techniques that brought it to life remain as eternal as time itself.